Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see so many faces. Um, welcome to the uh, Institute of Advanced Study, at least virtually welcome to our institute, which you see here behind me. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, have a meeting today where we have a new research fellow introducing himself and his uh, research questions. Uh, we'll talk about Fernando Nobrega Santos. Now, a few words about Fernando. Fernando was trained at the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brasilia. And um, he studied the uh, topical aspects of phase transitions in classical Hamiltonian systems. And later, worked on working as a visiting fellow in Oxford University Wilson's Center for Mathematical Biology. Now he's a research associate um, at the FU, FU, uh, the FU MC uh, Department of uh, Anatomy and Neurosciences in Amsterdam, anatomy. Um, and he studied brain networks under multi-modality and multi-layer perspectives. Um, he will be a research fellow at our institute, the Institute of Advanced Study here in Amsterdam for the coming year in part-time. And his main topic is uh, high order, uh, higher order interactions in brain networks study through multivariate information theory to understand how topology of the human brain networks relates to behavioral properties at the individual and group level, which is a truly complex problem, I guess. Um, during the lecture, you can ask questions through, uh, through the chat session. Uh, after the lecture, we have uh, ample time for uh, Q&A. Um, the lesson, the, ses the session is uh, recorded um, so and we will put uh, the link online later on. So uh, without further ado, I would like to ask uh, Fernando to share his screen and start his presentation. Thanks, Pete, for so nice introduction. So do you guys see my screen? Um, yes. Uh, Do you see the presentation mode or the? No, it's not the presentation mode. It's the, the full screen. Okay. all the windows we see. Okay. That's better. No. Yeah. That's good. Okay. So uh, first I'd like to thank Peter for organizing this event. And also Rihik, which is like my buddy at uh, IAS since I started. Uh, and uh, I also like to thank WMC. In Amsterdam for giving me this opportunity like to be this uh, bridge between IAS and uh, neuroscience, especially to Linda, uh, the PI of my group. So it's, it's a very exciting day for me. So I'd like to present my research ideas in high order interactions in complex systems. So I want to start first with a question. That's like a good start. So uh, what does what do stock markets or the climate change or even the COVID pandemic we have in common? So uh, what I can say that there are many things in common, maybe because of the topic of the conference, you already know, like they, they are systems whose exact behavior cannot be expressed using known equations. So there, there is no exact equation uh, like uh, for the stock market or for the for model the climate or for model the, the pandemic. So they are known as uh, complex systems. And uh, okay, the, Theoretical physicists already solved lots of questions in, in science over the last like 400, 500 years. But uh, I would say the most important questions in science nowadays are related in a way to, to complex systems and requires an interdisciplinary research effort. So I would say that uh, there are many ways to define it, but the way it is appropriate for this talk today, uh, that why I want to use topology and why topology may be relevant for complex systems is that the complex systems are systems whose dynamics are unknown and or very difficult to infer. So that most of the very interesting systems are complex systems nowadays. Uh, and then this IS fellowship is a really great opportunity because it gives very much room for interdisciplinarity and uh, gives me an opportunity to ask fundamental questions. So as Peter said, I, I had a, a, a interdisciplinary path, even not knowing, so I started theoretical physics first and start to study differential topology and phase transitions on the theoretical physics perspective. Then I also studied math biology 
and later moved to, to neuroscience now recently. So then after a while, I can see, okay, what could question I could ask as a like research agenda, not only for this fellowship. So I would like to, to then build, I, I did build a pathway to explore complex systems and all the complexity from different perspectives, from a theoretical perspective or from an empirical perspective. Uh, and in particular, I, I would like to zoom more into the brain, which is by far, at least for many people, is considered the most complex system. And then that's why combining this IES fellowship and with, with fellows at VMC uh, would be really nice for this project. Uh, so yeah, so then that's, that's kind of the paradigm. So we, we know that uh, the brain uh, is a complex system. There are many ways to, to model the brain, but I will focus today uh, in brain networks, but this fellowship, but this is very broad question. So I cannot answer this question in my lifetime, but I can narrow a bit more to maybe uh, contribute a bit to this field in one year and then in a career time. So uh, there are some core research questions I would like to answer. Some fellows that are also here attending this talk or also across the world uh, contribute to this question as well. But uh, I would like to, to address two questions that they seem not connected, but uh, this, is, this will be the building block of this talk. Uh, I would like to, to answer, how can we better quantify interactions in complex systems, especially in the rain? Uh, and uh, okay, maybe we cannot give the final answer, but we'd like to systematically explore this question. Uh, and the second question that perhaps unrelated, but it's definitely related, it's uh, on how can we relate these networks that we infer through interactions? Uh, how can we then correlate these networks with behavioral traits of individuals? That's a very, very important question. Perhaps it's more known in the theoretical biophysics field, like people call it, uh, I think it's a, that a Dutch scholar, like not Dutch, but a, a scholar based in in Netherlands, like it's called it like the physics of behavior. So how we, using insights from theoretical physics, you could infer behavior traits. So that's in theoretical biophysics done more in, in context of like a C. elegans or, or coli or bacteria, but uh, we could try out also this idea in brain networks. So these are the interdisciplinary questions and requires like a very uh, different backgrounds. And I, I think it's relevant for everyone in the audience and that's at least for me. And then I want to explain why. So why this is, this is re relevant. So basically in neuroscience, we, we are kind of uh, uh, in a pandemic, let's say, but if you don't understand the brain, we also have a, a, an agenda for next pandemic, like uh, in 30 years or so, the, we will age and then cognitive decline or neurodegeneration will be a really big problem. So it's really relevant to start neuroscience nowadays under all perspectives. So that's one very uh, important aspect of this fellowship, although we only want to contribute a little bit, but it's very relevant to the neuroscience aspect of this fellowship and the basic science aspect. So uh, if you understand that we start these high order interactions that I will discuss soon, we will allow complexity in the complex system formulation. So instead of only uh, focusing in the classic network formulation of of complex systems, we would allow the diversity of high order interactions to, to flourish. So that would be the like true main cores of this fellowship that we want to develop over the year. And uh, so I will start from from the beginning. So from the brain has a function brain net function network. That's uh, where I will give the examples where you want to apply where we did apply already some principles and where I want to go. Uh, you'll be our main kind of uh, object of study during this year. But uh, we know like, at least if you work a bit in complex systems, we, we know that a way to encode information about the complex system is uh, uh, using network theory. So we, we have networks everywhere, like in Facebook, Twitter, or even also in the brain. So you can get nodes uh, in, in the case of the brain, as areas of the brain, and then links are defined by uh, similarity measures between these areas in the brain. So we, we have some sort of universal way to encode information about interactions between the areas of the brain. 
and uh, that's the so-called like functional network uh, paradigm. So that's illustrated in, in these slides. And depending on the similarity measure, that we also depend on the modality of image you do. If it's like functional uh, connectivity of fMRI is different uh, metric could be physical coefficient or even formation theory metrics. Or if you use uh, mag uh, MEG metrics, you would use different uh, index, but you the paradigm is just that you have like a, a similarity measures between two nodes and then the similarity measures will define the links and that would give you the, the brain network. So if you do that for all areas of the brain, I'm illustrating here only for two points, you get this uh, kind of a brain network perspective. So I'm putting the strongest links force first in the network and illustrating how it could be a brain network from, from this similarity metrics in this animation. But then that comes now the question. So you have the high order paradigm. Uh, let's say uh, we have a three point interactions usually that are approximated via two point interaction. So if I can give a, a, an example, let's say I have a, a conversation with Peter, uh, with Pete, and then a conversation with Hick, and then the next day Hick has a conversation with Pete. So that means they had a, a but PYs we talk to each other, but if you would use normal approximation, you say that the three of us we also talk with. So that's unfortunately uh, often the case for for some network approaches. So when you count or compute uh, PYs interactions, you often neglect uh, high order interactions. So in this illustration, here is about the uh, like three point interaction, but you could think that for long for high order interactions for long, more than three point interactions. And it's very easy to grasp that this is a, an approximation. Just this example about the conversation, like the chat between three people, you cannot say that uh, three people talk to each other if they talk in PYs. So if you think that the sort of a brain network is a way to, to encode or to illustrate the communication in the brain, this approximation is not necessarily the best. So that's one reasoning that comes from your science. And there is another reasoning that could come from, from mathematics, from topology, information theory, that I would like to give an example that would be easier and I would keep the, the neuroscience example. So let's say, okay, in a physics, physicist approximation, I you say all these brain networks are circles. That's, that's, uh, that would be the kind of rationale of the fellowship. So if you think the brain network are circle, you will use the, all the tools and methodologies we know to classify then according to disease or to, to age or to cognition domains or whatever you want. But okay, there, there are lots of success in, in network science. So one could uh, use uh, these techniques to try to, to understand the uh, uh, brain networks. But if when you see as a circle, you see the brain in 2D. So if you use, use in two dimensions, so if you use only network sciences in a way geometrically, you're doing a planar analysis, so a two-dimensional analysis. If you want to go to, to high-order interactions, you will actually have uh, a lot of uh, new information coming on. That's, that's the kind of the funny aspect of this video you made. So it's basically, here is like just a trick. There are infinitely many different uh, 3D shapes whose projection in 2D are circles. So if you, if you think this rational uh, in networks, there will be infinitely many networks that are high order, that are like a three point networks, four point networks, whose projections are the same two point networks. So just play again this animation. So that means that we may lose a lot of information if you, if you only represent networks, especially the brain network via PYs interaction, we may lose lots of information because uh, of this dimensional aspect, you are actually uh, projecting the high dimensional part of the network into, into a 2D network. So you really need to, to go in a deeper direction in this way. So that's why I think a good, it's a good rationale beyond the, the rationale of the brain that uh, theoretically we are actually project information about your system. And then even more from a theoretical physics perspective, you could really uh, profit a lot using multidimensional representations. Uh, in fact, uh, it's very common in theoretical physics. 
So, you know, like uh, theoretical physics is based in Hamiltonian formulation. So each particle actually defines one dimension or uh, one dimension in your system, like in your Hamiltonian system. So that means that uh, in a way, most of the theoretical physics that was done over the past decades are, are multidimensional, where the, the PY's uh, network theory is actually planar, planar like it's just uh, not multidimensional. And then all the formulations of uh, between microscopic world and macroscopic world, this connection across scales that are made uh, for non-life matter, like in classical statistical mechanics or in classical physics are based in this uh, multidimensional representation. So if you actually can represent a complex system in this way, in this high order way, you could have a better representation in terms of having uh, analogs of results that comes from theoretical physics in network science, if you use high order interaction. So we uh, I already started this kind of rational, not only myself, but other scholars like uh, across the world. And I will illustrate this example soon. Uh, but basically, uh, I would like to use and to leverage for this uh, strategy or for this fellowship topology. That's, uh, that's kind of my, my first uh, training like in mathematical physics or during my PhD. So topology is uh, the branch of maths, like the subfield of maths that is concerned with properties of space that are preserved on the continuous deformation. I have to be careful now with the interdisciplinarity language because if you come from complex system, we always think about topology, topology of the network, how is the shape of a network, etc. But within pure maths, uh, topology is a branch of the maths that uh, is concerned with this, which properties of space uh, they, they are preserved when you have continuous deformations. And then in this example, this classical example for the, the like a topological joke, like for a topologies, a donut and the coffee cup are the same because uh, you can always deform if you suppose the material is uh, deformable uh, a donut uh, into a coffee cup so then why this is important why this will be uh, relevant uh, for complex systems so the the, the nice part is that because the topology is robust towards deformation we could say that in a complex system language this deformation would be noise so usually in the brain brain networks in many other uh, system like uh, in biology or in stock markets, whatever, you have a lot of noise. And uh, if you want to observe topological properties in, in complex systems, prob probably uh, topology, topological properties are the ones uh, the most robust against noise. And the nice part also is that uh, there is a deep relation between topology, lots of sense, not only topology in the network, and theoretical physics. So if you, if you want to contribute uh, how to make a a view of complex system that is more close to past results in in, uh, in complex in theoretical physics. Uh, I think that's a good way to go. I want to to remark uh, that uh, so where can we go and uh, give an example. So I just want to highlight it was a while ago already. So 2016, the Nobel Prize in Physics was given to three uh, physicists like Thales, Haldane, and Kosterlitz. And they, they got Nobel Prize, I would say that summarizing that uh, because they, they discovered the whole of topology in theoretical physics, especially uh, topological phase of matter. I will not go into details, but basically that there is uh, a way to explain uh, phenomena in physics that is more in the way of modeling, modeling through equations, et cetera, et cetera. But if you go more into the topological way of a topological field theory uh, or string theory, uh, usually uh, topological uh, metrics, they, they are in the, uh, behind the deep understanding of phenomena in physics. So if you want to bring these ideas also to complex system, you could profit by using high order interaction. So uh, I want to, to suggest these review papers that uh, like for physics, uh, like in complex systems, it would be to create a new way of, of seeing theoretical physics. So you could start from, from scratch in a way, but uh, also take advantage of knowing uh, what kind of uh, insights or results in physics could be uh, lended to, to complex systems. So then I would go to this uh, kind of uh, comparison that would, would uh, make, like let's say in one side, 
And the left side here is more a complex system view. The right side could be a theoretical physics or modeling view of, uh, of, uh, of the, the physical world of, of, the, of nature. So basically, if you use uh, to your modeling or to your, to your studies uh, methods of topology or geometry or even information theory, you can make application data driven. They are independent of coordinates and then they also based in multidimensional representations. Whereas if you want to do like classic, like also very important, but classic uh, mathematical modeling, uh, the modeling usually relay knowing your coordinate systems or modeling equations, or in those equations are using unknown complex systems. You have to approximate them or make a particular case for that. So what's very interesting, okay, that's in, we are in Netherlands. So there is this bridge, the Dutch bridge. So theoretical physics already made such a bridge. So you have, in, if you go through the past literature in physics, you can make this a uh, bridge. So both phenomena were already made uh, in th these two ways. So you can describe a classic like Newton's law, gravity equations for, for uh, Newton's law, et cetera. But you can also write a string theory that is all uh, coordinate invariant and only depends on topology. So this kind of rationale you could grasp from theoretical physics. So then, okay, I, I, I maybe gave a good motivation why you want to do this. I will now go to some applications uh, that of our previous works that illustrate this example. So I was very fortunate because I started my career in theoretical physics and then now I move it to, to complex systems. So I will give a, an example of this translation from one field to the other. So, uh, in the previous work, we illustrate how you can trans transpose results that came from theoretical physics to, to complex systems, especially to brain networks. And the, the example comes from, from a past work, actually was my PhD work, uh, that uh, if you relate uh, phase transitions to topology, uh, you could uh, indicate that the phase transition relates to, to change in topology of your system. So let's start from scratch. So a phase transition, like the classical example is like water boiling. So if you have, a, a, let's say water at 90, 90 degrees and then you raise the temperature of water to 91 degrees, nothing changes in terms of the, the structure of the molecules of water. So you have liquid state, but suddenly if you, if you in, increase a small change in the microscopic properties of the water, like you heat a bit more the water, like say, let's say from 99.9 .9 degrees to 100 degrees. So we have a macroscopic change. So this macroscopic change uh, associated to a microscopic change in your system is called a phase transition. And uh, in mathematics, you can grasp the, this phase transition through singularities in your observables. Like uh, for water, you could uh, track, let's say the, the heat capacity the, the, of the, the water. And then at some point, uh, you have the singularities, thermodynamic quantities. So what, what we showed in this paper 2009 I, during my, my PhD was that you could also have an analog for phase transition that is based only in topology. So if you can compute topological metrics in your physical system, in theoretical physics, you would find these singularities that are analogous to singularities in thermodynamic functions related to phase transitions. And what are those singularities and what's, why they are important? So those singularities and the, those metrics, uh, nowadays with this high order uh, approach in network science, you could uh, compute the, the, these metrics in, in uh, empirical data in network systems. So let's, let's explain how we can do that. So the invariant we focus in, in, in this work was the so-called Euler characteristics. So if you get uh, uh, Euler characteristics uh, of a polyedra, let's say, uh, you can define uh, as vertices minus edge plus face. So then let's compute the, the Euler characteristics for tetrahedra. So we have four vertices minus six edge plus four face. It's got equals to two. You can do the same for the cube and eight minus 12 plus six is equals to two and so on. So this property is universal in a way that for every convex polyedra, uh, the polyedra without holes, uh, they have a Euler characteristic two. And what does it mean? That means that this is a topological property. So they, they are invariant. Uh, and then Euler, a, a, a mathematician, so the, he discovered this property. That's why it's called Euler characteristics. 
And uh, what was studied over the past 20, 30 years in theoretical physics is that the Euler character is, is one of the indicators of phase transitions. Uh, so if you can compute the Euler characteristics in, in a Hamiltonian system, you can also uh, detect in many cases a phase transition. And that's what we did uh, for networks. So in a way, uh, okay, the way to compute the Euler characteristics in a network is a bit different, uh, but I will illustrate that that's exactly possible to make that. So you have here the, the uh, let's say, like how to illustrate this in, in the brain network. So you can compute, uh, instead of vertices, edge, and faces, you can compute the one point uh, representation of the uh, one point interaction of the vertices. You can compute the two point interactions, which, which are the edges, and then three point interactions with the triangles of the networks, and four point interactions, and so on. So if you compute this, uh, and you do some sort of analogy, let's say uh, that the only characteristic in the polyhedra was vertices minus edges plus phase. So in the case of a network, you'd be just uh, the alternate sum of these structures, these high order structures in the network, you can compute the other characteristics. Of course, in, in physics, the, the, the parameter that triggers a phase transition is temperature. So every time, let's say you compute the temperature, you have a temperature of your system, you check whether water melts or not, or boils or not. So in this case, for the brain network, what the part that we need that parameter to get the phase transition. So in this case, it would be the density. So when I started this video, I started an empty graph, and then I start to an empty network, and then I start to increase the density of the network. And that uh, leads to, to analogous, at least geometrically, analogous transitions in the network. So I, that's what I want to show in the ne next slide. So. What we did was that, okay, if you make this analogy, so in theoretical physics, you had the change in this hypersurface, and then some topological change are relevant change and they are related to phase transitions. Uh, you can do the same in the brain. So you can start uh, including new links in the brain. And at some point you have, uh, uh, we start with an empty network and you have a completely fully connected network. At some point you have a phase transition. This is the so-called giant component transition or percolation transition. So that's kind of uh, what people would understand about phase transitions uh, before this, this analogy. And then if you, you can have the same, but now instead of uh, including new links in the network, you can include uh, new triangles in the network. And then at some point uh, you have a percolation of those triangles. And then we, ha we have this uh, phase transition similar to the first one that I just showed you. And then in this work we did, uh, uh, we did run this ana analysis of the, the other characteristics for all, for a database of the human connectome, about 900 uh, individuals, so in gray here. And then you see that the, those phase transitions, they, they, they are kind of a signature of those brain networks that we studied. And uh, that was a very nice result because uh, it was very practical result. Like we inferred these results in brain network, but all the inspiration was theoretical, like we, we knew the result already in theoretical physics and the hypothesis was translational, or let's see whether, whether the ideas from theoretical physics, they translate to the brain. And that was really, really nice. And then we move a bit further. Let's say, is it possible to, to uh, use these transitions as high order markers or how, in which way? So you can think that uh, uh, the transition points in materials in nature they are some sort of uh, markers of the material. So if you say, okay, water boils at 100 degrees at sea level is a property of water. And, uh, or that wa water melts at zero degrees at sea level is also a property of water. Of course, it's not one-to-one, -one, but uh, what, what is, can be done is that uh, you can infer that, okay, if something that melts or that boils at 100 degrees uh, at sea level, at sea, at sea, is, is, it, is there a chance that this thing, this material is water? So it's very likely to be water, yes or no. So we can think that uh, the, the phase transition points from, from material are kind of markers of material. Then we made the same question for, for, for a brain network data. So in the, the first answer was positive. So we had a very motivating like result. So we did a, uh, at, with our data. Uh, so in, in, in red, we have a, the phase transition diagram for individuals with glioma. Glioma is a brain tumor, a space of brain tumor. 
And then we have uh, this pattern for phase transitions. We also have a, a matched control data. Uh, and then you have a second pattern of phase transitions. When, when you compare those two patterns, we see that uh, the phase transition points are different. So in a way, if you follow this analysis, uh, you can see that these are good uh, analogies between theoretical physics principles and the complex system uh, uh, in practical applications. So we did this application like uh, end of 2019. And since then there was some papers with analogous results. So there was a paper with similar results in attention deficit disorders. There, there was another uh, you know, team that uh, working in C elegance data. And I saw also principles in uh, uh, this field that I talk, talk uh, physics of behavior where the fluctuations around the uh, phase transition also drives the behavior of, of C elegance that was recently on archives. Uh, so it's very inspiring this, this idea. So, but what, what would be the logic, what would be the rational? So in theoretical physics, you would have microscope word that goes to microscope word. So if you uh, like a statistical mechanics formulations, you would have uh, a Hamiltonian or equations for your microscope word. And then with some hypothesis and modeling, you could infer properties of microscope word. So unfortunately, this is not possible in complex systems. However, it's possible to infer the interactions. So then instead of thinking about micro versus macro, we can think local versus global. And, uh, and then you can infer the interactions in your complex system. And then it, there are local properties. You don't know exactly what is the length scale of this interaction. It depends on the application you want to work with. So maybe it's more appropriate to talk with local property. And then you infer global properties of the system or behavioral properties of the system. So what then we did was like, OK, there was this principle in statistical physics that would explain sort of uh, using topology phase transitions. And then we kind of follow the same rationale for brain networks. And then we found this, this analogy with also with topological phase transitions, but now in complex systems. So that's kind of a summary of, of our, our work. But uh, I want to focus now what we're going to do in, in uh, IES and also if fellows uh, across the, uh, the world. Uh, so it's how to make it better. So how, how this idea can be improved. So that's what, what comes with my, the expertise I don't have, but IS has, and my fellows like Rick uh, also is helping a lot in this project. So the idea is now to use information theory to infer these high order interactions. So the, there are quite some activity in this topic. So some fellows in France and UK, they already think about this idea, so how, how you get the uh, high order interactions using information theory metrics. So I'm basically the last slide I show you what I would like to do is just cut this step, like this step is p wise step. So all the interactions here to create the uh, correlations between areas of the brain are between two points only. So you actually, maybe you lose information if you do like that. So the idea is then to use a more advanced uh, approach to, to infer those interactions. So then I want to illustrate the idea that I want to, to implement uh, is I will state for three point interaction, but the idea could be for, for different uh, orders of interaction. So we have like, like three, uh, let's say time series, if you start fMRI or MEG, uh, and then before you only compute the similarity between two areas of the brain. Now we would like to try out to find a similarity between three areas of the brain. And there are several ways to do that in information theory. There are also work done on how to relate that uh, with topology, as I think Pierre Bordeaux and others, uh, theoreticians, uh, also in UK. So you have different approach, but the, the basic idea we would like to associate as uh, how the interactions or simplices, and that's the techno term, uh, directly from the data. And, uh, and then instead of creating the net, the PYS connectivity, I will have a key point connectivity, like some sort of tensor representation that would give the, let's say in this case for triangle, uh, that you give the three point uh, interaction between areas of the brain. And then we hope that if you do it like that, uh, we may uh, contribute to a be better formulation. So there is, there is already some work on how to do this theoretically. So we would like to implement that in, in, in a fashionable way. 
and contribute uh, to the understanding of, of functional and brain network in clinical neuroscience. So yeah, what, how, how that relates with, with the second question of the fellowship, like uh, we want to connect these uh, properties or high order properties with behavioral traits of, of individuals and, and why, how, why want to do that? So there is evidence, so there are a few papers, so if you're interested, I can send to you those papers I just mentioned. But uh, there are a few, few, one paper is particularly recent paper that uh, shows that topological properties of high order brain networks, they correlate with uh, behavior traits of individuals, cognitive scores of individuals. So this paper uh, uh, from a group in US, they, they study the human connectome project with about thousand individuals and they use this uh, high order approach, like topological data analysis approach to, to infer uh, whether the, there is correlations between uh, behavioral traits of individuals and the topological properties of the networks. They, they had significant results, but yet uh, small explanation, explanatory power. So we would like to check whether a better formulation for, for high order interactions in, in, in brain networks would lead to, to to better explanatory power for behavioral traits. So we we have quite quite a good plan. So I don't think one year will be enough to make the plans. I think it will be many years to go. Uh, but we we then look for the bridge. So we, we look to this for the Dutch bridge. So we're looking for connection between the behavioral traits and these high order networks. We try out in a, in a group of health subjects in our in our team. It's called like a Mumo. Uh, database that it's really nice uh, database to work with uh, the team and Lucas particularly uh, because we have different modalities and also different uh, uh, cognitive uh, domains uh, uh, for those individuals and later we'll, we'll try out uh, to check these ideas for neurological diseases within the team uh, in glioma and multiple sclerosis and uh, within collaboration in UK uh, James and David uh, in stroke uh, so we hope to, to test the, those hypotheses in, in, in a very practical way. Uh, so, and how, how are we going to, to do that? Because if you try this approach, it's kind of nice, the idea, but it, it leads a, a lot of information. So the consequence of having this is that you have a lot of high order information about the networks and how do you want to find what's the correct uh, correlate for cognition? for behavioral traits. So it's a very difficult question, but working with neuroscientists, we know that we have to narrow our questions. So uh, there are lots of uh, papers on cognition and network science, and some of them, they, they, they give really nice insights, but as was discussed that today, uh, in a way, uh, network theory can kind of project high order representations into PYS representation, so they, that uh, that maybe uh, fogs a bit the results from net network science. So even if you have the right mechanism and the right metric to predict the cognition, it could be that if you do a similar approach or similar hypothesis to high order networks, you may predict uh, uh, behavioral traits. So then I, I think the first idea, first we need to set up the methods and implement it well and have these high order metrics in complex systems. But once you do that, we kind of want to, to to showcase or to test uh, in in works in our team and in in, in work that uh, was inspired in our team. So I would highlight one example here from Linda Dow's uh, Vidis project and actually from Lucas Reed PhD. So we have this uh, the so-called like multi-layer project. So if you have a multi-modality imaging here, I, I exemplify like structural connectivity, functional connectivity, and MEG connectivity. You could uh, create a, within a network approach, high order or uh, multi-layer network. And uh, you could uh, predict as active functioning using this approach. So we know which the metric is now is the, the eigenvector centrality. So multi-layer metrics are enough to predict uh, as active functioning in, in, in our data. So if you go to this transactional hypothesis one, a uh, way to formulate uh, what, what we are looking for concretely, you could uh, make the same hypothesis, but now for higher order metrics. So in the same way, people can define a, a multi-layer centrality, you could define high order centralities. 
which is already defined in the literature, and then check for this whether this uh, metric improves. Uh, if you do it in high order uh, perspective, you could have improvement improving uh, the explanatory power of uh, executive functioning uh, using using high order metrics. So that's some sort of uh, example on how we would like to to use those methodology for practical purpose and to forecast in a way to predict uh, behavioral traits uh, in in brain net in brain networks. Of course, this is really uh, ambitious project. So if you make this happen, it's already really, really nice. And uh, then this is also just just the beginning. So then I want to finish with, say, with the beginning. So that's uh, what comes next. So first, I would like to thank you uh, for all the time, the time of all of you for this uh, talk. And, uh, and I want to say that this is only the first of a series of activities that I guess we promote on high order interactions over the year. So we will try out uh, with Hick and Pete and all the fellows in IES to, to promote uh, seminars and workshops on high order interactions, both for like technical people, like people from maths and physics, and for uh, people willing to apply high order interactions in complex systems. So that's kind of the goal of this year, like to implement these ideas and also to bring people together in, in to work in this topic. And I also like to thank all the collaborators. There are so many that I don't dare to put the name here, otherwise I will forget, but I'm working this project with people in Brazil, former students and collaborators, friends from Spain, like Serafine, France, uh, Mathieu in UK, uh, James and David, and uh, in the team, like Linda, uh, Eduardo, Lucas, all uh, former students, Julia, and every, everyone, and Mini. So I really like to thank all of you for for giving me the opportunity to, to present in doing this work. Yes, yeah, so, and then I would like to use the rest of the time to get feedback of all of you, because this is just the beginning. I would appreciate to receive feedback from the audience now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Fernando, for a really well presented piece of research um, and for addressing those big questions. Uh, and, and also kind of a look at uh, what's, what's, what's going to happen in the coming year um i can imagine there are quite some questions so maybe if you uh stop sharing your slides then i can see um who might be willing to ask a question so whom can i give the floor just raise your hand or just start unmute and go ahead um uh, mention you who you are please <laughs> yeah i'm, I'm yeah, yeah. nice to meet you Fernando, at least so thank you for the nice talk. Um, I would have a question re with respect to what you presented is mostly uh, on undirected graph and undirected, uh, let's say, complex or stuff like this. Um, and it is very interesting also to have a look at, uh, let's say, uh, causal relationships within the, within the brain as, as, a, as a decomposition of the interactions. And there are plenty of uh, uh, informational way to look at this following uh, uh, following Perl, following uh, tra transfer entropy, and so on. D did you think about looking at causal re relationships with your with your approach? Yeah, that's a very good question. So first, nice to meet you, and thanks for coming and for your input. So hope to talk to you more during the fellowship. Uh, yeah, so it's to put causality and put directionality in the interactions is a really hard task, I would say would be next, next, like uh, for my, like at least the skills I have now uh, and the team that the ideas we put together was more like try to build the, the simplicial complex of the networks using information theory and, and all, quite uh, strongly based in your work, let's say like that. Uh, and, uh, and of course, if that is enough to explain uh, cognition and behavioral traits in, in in neuroscience, we would explore a bit more. But if not, you're right that uh, then, uh, it, of course, in the more realistic uh, scenario is really to have directionality and causality in the interactions. But I would say this is really even more difficult talk. Maybe you are already in this wave, but uh, yeah, this is, I, I would say uh, it's on the agenda, but would maybe be a, a later step 
like I would first check whether there is this bridge between these high order networks and the behavioral traits. And then if not, if, if you still true believe this analogy, then I would go for, for the causality and directionality. I don't know if that answers, but thanks. Okay, who else can I give the floor? While you guys are thinking of a question, I have a, a small, uh, just to clarify. Um, so I seem to remember some work on, on uh, hyper networks, phase transitions in hyper networks by some Jeff, I forgot his last name. Um, and, and one of the issues of the phase transition was that he asked himself the question whether um, the system was, was ergodic in the sense that, you know, you need to have like a continuous space that you can explore completely. Is that, is that relevant at all at, uh, for your research? I think, I think so, at least for the theoretical aspects, because the phase transition is most often defined in thermodynamic limit. So uh, we have an infinitely many number of particles. So in theoretical physics, you can reach easy, it's not exactly, but easy that because uh, the Avogadro number is the number you deal with, the 6 to 23. And in networks, it, the dimensionality is it's, uh, much smaller. So you may have uh, difficulties to reach uh, such ideas. And then you would also have to think what's kind of, uh, what would be the analog of this uh, hypothetic hypothesis. Because in, in a way, so uh, for the specific case of the brain, you would say that there is a mean distribution for this topological invariance. Uh, and then each individual is a stochastic realization of uh, those invariants. So that's why they deviate a bit, also because of the size of the network. And, uh, and then if you want, then in this stage, you could come with some uh, ergotic hypothesis or with some idea why, how you could make this bridge. Uh, because I, in the ergotic idea, you have uh, the time average, they, they must also uh, co coincide with your measure average. So then you can make this uh, ergoticity comes to the place. But yeah. I, don't, I don't see exactly what would be the bridge uh, in that stage, but yeah, it's, it's a very relevant question. Okay. And another question you presented, uh, I think it was cleogoma, uh, brain tumor versus a control. And you say, okay, well, you know, the, the, the phase, the, the location of the phase transitions um, are, are different. So there might be an indicator of something, right? But so there was no error bar on that. So how, uh, the, the differences look relatively small in your epsilon axis. Um, how significant were, the, were those numbers? Yeah, in that report, like this was a physics paper, so we don't put this uh, statistics, we, we kind of hide the statistics. But uh, in the recent studies we did, especially with Julia, that's in the audience, and uh, Eduarda, so we did the statistical tests on, on different database and we have produced those results, and they are significant different. Uh, they're quite robust, but okay, the neuroscience wants to know more. So the, the big question let's say Linda has, and we also have, uh, is that whether those differences they relate with uh, the behavioral traits of the people with glioma. And the glioma is, is a very peculiar uh, uh, brain uh, disease because the variability is really high. So you have a, a people with tumors in different size and uh, different outcomes of epilepsy, lack of uh, cognition, uh, uh, problems. So there are so many variability that is uh, is difficult to, to track. So we are doing our last one of the last tests in, in the data we have, but uh, we would like to to see actually whether the the variability that we found that we illustrated uh, uh, in this in this work correlates with any trait of the patients. But in terms of statistical dif group difference, is it's true, but uh, the okay. question now is the the if that this different correlates with the individual traits. Okay, I see. I know Rick has a question. Um, I'm not sure if I can give him the floor. There he goes. Yes, I'm here. I think, um, of course, I have many questions, but uh, luckily I will uh, work with you. All right. So you say that. So one, you said that one of the problems is that, uh, you know, you build this correlation matrix, right, of one-to-one -one correlations, and then you try to yeah. find these uh, synthesis. And so you wanted to skip that uh, step. 
that's what you said, right? So are there any it's more uh, particular ideas about that? Like how to skip that yeah. step? Because yeah, that sounds like a very difficult thing to do, right? Yeah, so that's why I, I have to work with you. It's like, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, so the, we need each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the, the problem is that, uh, yeah, if you get a correlation matrix, it's a natural way to define the, the edge uh, weights, but uh, you lose information if you want to define uh, three point interactions in that way. So you would need uh, formulations of uh, uh, multivariate interactions. Uh, to quantify them, to quantify those interactions. And uh, when you go to the market, the, the field that did this better was information theory. That's exactly how this project came. I think when we met was back 2019 and then there was this Beyond Shannon event. So, and then we met uh, James and then we had this discussion. I was already intrigued with this phase transition paper. And, uh, and I, I was clear that it was not the best way to compute the interactions, but was not clear what was the alternative. And then uh, that's kind of one of the steps of this project would, would be uh, what's the best uh, metric to compute this multivariate uh, information metric. So th there are some few papers. So a few some from Pierre that is in the audience. He, he maybe can tell a bit more on that. And there is one from the group in the UK from, from Fernando Rosas. Uh, they already tried to do such uh, tests, but they didn't use the network theory or topological data analysis. So it was more quantifying the multivariate information metrics in, in, in a cohort of health individuals. And they correlated this uh, multivariate metrics uh, with aging. Uh, but yeah, one of the challenges of this project would, would be uh, what's the best uh, multivariate metric then? Uh, and then so, if one. So, so, but so if you're saying that, uh, so most topological data analysis methods, they do. Uh, depart from this correlation matrix, right? Yes, uh, they. That's but, called, yeah, they, sorry. Yeah. So, and, and you're saying, okay, that doesn't sound like a good idea because we want to look for high order interactions, but maybe you already kind of uh, throw them away by this intermediate step. So, but is this quantifiable yeah. somehow? Like, could we somehow demonstrate, prove, quantify, calculate? that this is indeed the case and that maybe the current way of TDA, like not only, you know, you, but uh, around the world are somehow uh, missing something. Yes, that's the, the goal that we have in a way, like to showcase this, we should do both analysis. Let's say if you have this uh, idea to forecast cognition or behavioral traits using TDA, you, you would build uh, our high order metrics uh, first, let's say the classic way, that's a viatory approximation, so the click approximation. And then you do the, the more natural way, the multivariate way, and then you could compare those proposals. And then if they, they are different, then that, that means that high order interacts, interactions uh, really uh, has more to say other than the, the click approximation. Yeah, that's okay, so we we really need to solve then one problem to show already the second. Yeah, that is, yeah that's a many problems. Yeah, that's a pity. <laughs> okay, so any other questions or remarks? Yeah, Matthias, go ahead. Hi. Um, so first of all, thank you for the great talk. Um, building up a bit on the, this new approach that you're actually using. So from a theoretical physics background and also a little bit hooking up from what Pierre Bodo uh, has mentioned about uh, networks with directionality. So in, phys in theoretical physics, you see quite a diverse number of uh, topological invariants that can be used in several different places in quantum field theory. You would actually talk about Simon's numbers and other sort of winding numbers for topological phases or for quantum phases. Um, I, I find it quite exceptional, quite quite surprising that uh, the Euler characteristic is um, the important thing about this um, topological analysis of the of networks. Um, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about that, and so hooking up with the, the network with directionality, how maybe there would be other topological invariants that would be relevant as well as the 
spoiler characteristic to be taken into account once you move further into your research. Oh, Matias, many thanks for, for the questions and nice to see you again. Uh, so it's a very important question. I would say the other characteristics are one of the simplest invariants and that's, that's nice Then it's good to explain in interdisciplinary uh, context. But indeed, there are other invariants that you should seek uh, for some approximation. So if you if you assume uh, some sort of distribution of the homology groups, I mean more technical now, uh, but distributions of these loops in the high order loops, uh, under some hypothesis, the transitions are uniquely defined by the Euler characteristics. But if if you have really complex data where the distribution of the high order loops are not uh, unimodal, so you may need a new metrics to 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 investigate those transitions. So I, I do think this could be just the beginning. If you really, if we start this agenda, let's say, oh, uh, complex system has different ways to understand. And one way would be that you can build uh, uh, results in, in complex system that are analogs to results in theoretical physics. We, it, there's a really a lot of things to be done. Like, uh, and then the, the first invariants that are being computed now are based in topological data analysis, which is really nice approach and would be a big tool for this uh, research agenda. But the focus is more in pattern recognition in a way. So then you would have to draw draft uh, what are the variants that are important in theoretical physics, Shine Simons uh, theory or index uh, theorems, or all these theorems in theoretical physics. Then you would make some sort of, uh, as he could just say, like, okay, you have to solve this, 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 or one. After the other, I think this leads to years of research to make this list. So it's very nice that you pointed that. Thank you. Okay. Any last question? Well, do know that we uh, have ample time to uh, interact with Fernando, hopefully the coming year. Um, we hope to open up the Institute as soon as possible again. We will definitely start with small meetings in a, in a short time. Um, and one of the first small, small meetings will be with Fernando. So that's, uh, that's a good follow up to this. Um, also know that this um, lecture has been recorded so you can look it back if you want. Of course, you can email us or directly um, if you have any questions or suggestions for collaboration. And I look very much forward to meet all of you face to face soon, anytime. Um, in the meantime, stay happy, stay healthy. And I hope to see you in the Institute. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, Fernando. Thank you. Thanks for the audience. And then, as I say in the end, so please don't hesitate in contact if you want to get involved in any aspect of this project. Thanks, Fernando.